<laughs> okay, while well, everyone's getting settled, I um, just want to say a big thank you to everyone for joining us today. We've got a very exciting panel. I know everyone's been saying that about their panels, but my one really is very exciting, and I'll tell you why. Um, we're talking about fashion. I mean, you all got clothes on, so I'm sure you understand fashion, um, at least enough to join this conversation. What I have done this time round, um, last year was the first time I was at COP, and I was also doing another fashion panel. And I remember one of the uh, people in the audience put their hand up, and when I asked them, what's your question? They said to me, how come your panel isn't diverse? It doesn't represent the voices of the industry. So this really stayed with me. And I thought to myself, if I work with them again for COP28, I'm going to make sure that I have a very diverse panel on stage. And uh, I'm happy to say it was a mission that I accomplished. So I will tell you why I accomplished it. We've got Sophie, um, who is from Belgium, and she's going to talk about human rights. No one talks about human rights when it comes to sustainability. They just talk about how their T-shirt made up of this amazing fabric, but who made that T-shirt? And were they made in the good conditions? So we have brought human rights to the conversation. We have got Nisha. She is representing the Orr Foundation. So we're talking Global South. Last time I did a conversation on sustainability, it was very focused on the solutions being provided by the Global North. But nobody invited the Global South to this conversation in terms of fashion, sustainability, innovation, and policy. So Nisha is here to represent and to kind of give us learning moments about how we can collaborate with the Global South. We have got Fernanda. She's coming from the activism point of view. She's from Fashion Revolution. So she's going to be able to share with us information about worker rights, about the things that the Fashion Revolution is doing, a very important part of the conversation. We've got uh, Nikolai. He is from Ghani. So we've got fashion on the table. I thought it was very important. If we're going to talk about fashion, we need to have fashion in the conversation. Hence why we've got Nikolai. And he brings a wealth of knowledge, and he's also an advocate of sustainability within the fashion industry. And last but not least, we've got Bodhi, and we're talking about manufacturing. When you speak about sustainability, you have to bring the manufacturers to the conversation because they are part of the problem as well and helping us solve it. So it's so important to have manufacturing at the table. And Bodhi has a wealth of experience to bring as well. So when I tell you that I put together a panel that is very much covering all corners, you can see it here. And if you're asking yourself, where's the youth perspective? Well, I can say Nisha also represents the youth perspective as well. Um, and, and kind of brings that voice to the table. So today, I don't want to focus too much on the problems, which I think the panelists know. I want to focus on actionable solutions. I want you guys to leave this room knowing exactly what your next step is going to be. Understanding what isn't working and being able to implement that in your business plan. So let's begin. Let's jump straight in. Sophia, I'm going to talk to you first about problems. Can you highlight for us which is the biggest problem for you so far? Thank you so much for the, the invitation and the organization. So I would go straight to the point. For us, the biggest problem is that um, the fashion industry is buyer driven, which means that there is a huge power imbalance between the buyers and the suppliers. And that means that actually um, that's the root cause for a lot of chains of human rights violations afterwards. Um, if suppliers uh, don't feel they can really have a say, they are in a situation where they cannot really ensure that human rights are going to be respected. And this is putting them under a lot of pressure, and it puts then workers and cotton farmers under a lot of pressure. Um, and we will go to the solutions afterwards. Thank you, Sophie. And Nisha, what do you identify to be the biggest problem? Thank you, Machinata. So, to summary, the biggest problem that I'm here sitting to you talking today is the fact that there is too much clothing. We are simply producing too much clothing that is having impacts all along the fashion value chain, all the way down to textile waste in the downstream. I think the issue of textile waste is one that not everybody is aware of. And the reason is because once we dispose of our clothes, we are not sure where that goes to. 
We may give our clothes to charity shops, we may give our clothes to brands through a take-back scheme, but do we really understand where our clothes end up? The reality that I'm here to share with you today is that the clothes end up in communities like the one in Cantamanto in Accra, Ghana, where they receive 50 million tons of garments a week. And the local community there are very skilled in upcycling, repair, and recommodifying this clothing to actually be resold in the local community. Whilst they are able to do this, the issue is the bales of clothing that they purchase, on average, 40% of that is actually waste. And where does that waste actually go to? It goes into the local environment. And simply too many clothes that we are producing where we are relying too much on fast fashion trends, where they produce high volumes, where poorer quality means that the local community cannot sell this. This goes to the beaches. It pollutes our waterways, our seas. We do not have the local construction, the waste management facilities to manage all of this. So at the core, we need to reduce our, our consumption and our production of clothing in order to address the solutions which my organization, the All Foundation, is working on, which I will come to later. Thank you, Nisha. Fernanda? Hi. Well, as a Brazilian, I wanted to bring the attention for the relationship between fashion and deforestation. So when we talk about deforestation in the Amazon, for example, we have the leather issue that is totally related. And also the cotton production in Brazil, we are one of, one of the biggest cotton producers in the world. And this cotton is being related to the devastation of the Cerrado, which is a kind of Brasilia savanna. And we need to, to talk about this because this is impacting the local people, uh, the biodiversity, and yes, and we are producing like for the, for the world. It's not just for the Brazilians, brands, and for the, our local production. It's like uh, we're exporting this material, leather and cotton. Thank you, Fernanda. Nikolai? Um, yeah, so from my point of view, whether that's as a founder of Gani, a fashion brand, or as an investor in innovative new climate technology, uh, and whether the issues we're faced with pertains to living wage or supply chain transparency or bringing down your carbon footprint, the biggest challenge that I'm faced with is the lack of uh, financial in incentives along the supply chain to initiate activities around the green transition. And Bode. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if we look at the manufacturing side, uh, you know that manufacturing is very labor-intensive uh, kind of industry. Uh, just to give you a context, uh, we have about uh, 28,000 employees. And when you look about that, it's not just 28 that we cover, 28,000, but it's triple by three, right? because it involves the family, uh, the son, and perhaps the community. So uh, working capital is a challenge for us. Uh, if you look at the fund, if you look at the green fund, for, uh, for example, the difference between the normal and the green fund is just like a 0.25%, which is nothing. So that's... That's the biggest challenge. And uh, the, other, the other side is, is, is a mindset. Mindset, we have to drive from the mindset uh, to be able to bring the whole organization uh, to follow uh, uh, the process that we want to grow in terms of the sustainability. Thank you. I mean, you've all addressed very different problems, and I'm sure in the audience they probably can also pinpoint other problems that the fashion industry has. We do have many. Um, I want to talk now about policy, because we, we've, we've addressed the problems. We've, we've identified what we consider to be the biggest problems. But I want to bring policy into it, because I think a lot of people have viewed it as, as the silver bullet, as what's going to solve these problems. But I would love for you to let me know what kind of challenges and opportunities do you think that policy brings to the table? Because I know you understand that fashion is very unregulated. I always view fashion as teenagers that need discipline. Um, so how do you think policy is going to play a key role? Do you think it's going to challenge the industry? Do you think it's an opportunity for us to do better? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anyone want to start? Oh. Okay, sorry. Uh, 
so I can I can go first. Uh, so you mentioned silver bullet. I think no legislation is going to be a silver bullet if it's not really designed with um, the first consent um, involved. So we really need, uh, and that's why in FedTrad we really try to have this um, uh, multi-stakeholders approach, putting in the same room companies and workers, farmers, etc. So that's first the key point because what we see from the legislations that are on the table is that they are not fully satisfactory, and for them to really be implemented in the in the best way, they will need really to start with uh, meaningful stakeholders engagement. Uh, and multi-stakeholders engagement. So that's the first thing. I, I don't want to lose the, the audience by going into the details of the legislation. Just three very quick things. The first one is that there is a legislation on human rights and environmental due diligence on the agenda of the European Union. Um, the problem is that it targets only the largest companies at EU level. And the fashion industry is actually quite fragmented. So actually, it's unlikely that this is really going to be a game changer for the workers in the industry. But we are still really trying to, to influence it to make sure that living wage is mentioned there. And we can discuss about wages later on in the discussion. Um, and then the second big thing is around uh, banning what we call unfair trading practices. Um, in the textile sector, and the European Parliament is asking for that. So it's around um, ensuring that companies cannot um, cancel contracts at the last minute, that they cannot uh, pay uh, um, with uh, big delays, which is going to put suppliers in difficulty, etc. So that's really key. If there is one thing that you can do is really calling for this ban of unfair trading practices in the textile sector. And the last thing is around... Um, um, forced labor. So there is also a regulation at EU level that is negotiated on, on um, uh, access to prohibiting access to markets in the EU for products produced with forced labor. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but that's also a key thing that is on the agenda of the of the EU. Um, perhaps if I piggyback off what Sophia has just said, because I think the idea of having a multi-stakeholder approach is really what is essential to ensure that the new ESG regulation we have coming in for fashion is able to internalise the adverse externalities, the externalities being the unintended negative consequences of the fashion industry's production and consumption. And this is really hinges on the work that the All Foundation do, as they've been sending delegates from the Cantamanto Marco, that is the upcyclers, the retailers, to the EU to actually inform and share the realities of the issues that are happening in the local market as they are not aware of this. And we do understand that what has happened and all of the impacts that we are seeing on fashion is because there is a lack of visibility. We are focused on the global north. That's where the brands are headquarters are. That's where their main consumers are, that they're not aware of the realities that do happen in the global south. But through multi-stakeholder partnerships and actually including them in the conversation, you can have an understanding of this, of the real realities that they face. And then taking that, we then drive for action. So what does this action actually actually look like. I will use the example of the extended producer responsibility regulation that the EU is currently working towards. And what extended producer responsibility means for those in the audience that are not aware is that it, it gives the brand responsibility and accountability to what happens to clothing post-consumer consumption. This is particularly important regarding the impacts and the pressures on the local resources I've described already in Cantamanto. So one of the things that we are campaigning for at the All Foundation is for the extended producer responsibility to have a fair fee with which we can ensure that there will be sufficient funds transferred to communities in the global south. We are also campaigning to make sure that there is global accountability to ensure that those funds don't just stay in the EU, so not with the companies that are sorting and collecting the waste, but actually being able to go to the communities on the front lines of managing those impacts. But crucially, coming back to my main issue here, is the fact that we also need policy to address the issue at the core. So as part of this campaign, we are also asking that the external producer responsibility encourage brands to disclose their production volume which could inform targets to reduce that. 
just before I finish so other speakers can speak, I think it's important that this last point that I've made on production volumes highlights the need for data. Policy needs to encourage and incentivize brands to report on their data because these are the reasons why the impacts have occurred from the social, the human rights issues to some of the environmental challenges we have here. And then the last thing is to make sure that policy stays flexible. This is new to us, addressing the impact across the fashion chain, so we are going to be learning from the policy. To ensure that the policy is actually learning, we need to be able to take lessons learned from that, be able to adjust for any issues that are still occurring. So policy needs to make sure that they design with flexibility in mind. Thanks. That's quite a good amount of uh, information there. I mean, I got some learning points. Um, Nikolai, would you like to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, from a kind of hands-on operational point of view, we actually totally welcome any kind of like policy measures or regulatory measures, ideally also some financial incentives, uh, but uh, anything that will kind of help level the playing field and incentivize more people to kind of support the green transition. And to put things into perspective, at Gany, at the moment, we are observing around 40 different pieces of legislation that are somewhat relevant to us. 18 of those will directly impact our business, and six are kind of the pieces we'll be implementing or navigating around next year. So it does have like proper hands-on impact on how we conduct our business. We, we had a growing frustration some years ago that politicians didn't have the guts to implement uh, carbon taxes. So we started mapping out our carbon footprint in 2016, and partly in order to kind of get a full view of our carbon pollution but, and, and the sources that it was derived from, but more so to implement uh, kind of fiduciary uh, penalties on ourselves, because nothing beats kind of regulating human behavior as uh, penalties does, financial penalties. So it was our way of kind of levying our own carbon tax on ourselves. I think that fashion brands can learn a lot from what you said. Um, understanding policy and knowing what's going to directly affect them is so important because I think I heard it once described it's going to be a bloodbath is the word that's been used uh, in Brussels um, with, with regards to fashion because a lot of fashion brands are not taking that initiative of learning what uh, regulations are going to affect them directly. You would like to add something, Fernanda? Oh, well, about related to the production, like cotton production, it's important to say that in Brazil, the legislation is supporting the big producers, not the small one, the ones that are the uh, familiar productions, the familiar agricultures that work, uh, you know, in small territories, producing food or cotton altogether, not depending just one crop. And also, uh, in Brazil, we have pesticides that are just allowed to be used in Brazil. So, you know, we have like poison in our soil, in our water, in our people. So, yes, this is something. And it's getting worse and worse. And Bodhi, would you like to add anything with regards to the role that policy will play in manufacturing? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, I give a, a specific example about Indonesia for this case. Uh, last year, the Chamber of Commerce of Indonesia started this, uh, uh, what you call a movement for the Net Zero Hub. Uh, this organization is like embracing the whole industry in Indonesia, outside the government yet. And they want to try uh, everybody to be involved in the Net Zero Hub. First thing that they have to do is measure. Just look where your hotspots are, right? But once you know the hotspots, then you know what to do. So basically, this is coming from the industry itself, from the corporate first, uh, before the government try to initiate something for the industry. So probably this also will help uh, other country to look uh, from a dis different perspective to help the industry to move together. You know, that's what I think. Um, I mean, I think policy in general is going to play a very key role, but I'm very interested to, to kind of see how it's going to affect the industry and who's actually going to survive it. So let's move it on to scalable innovations, because I want to talk about that, because in my experience, a lot of technology that's out there currently can actually help fashion brands be able to comply to legislations. So are there any scalable innovations that you are aware of that you'd like to share with our audience today? 
um, any kind of technology, especially with you, Nicola. I know you speak a lot about material innovation. Um, could you share maybe your findings, um, your challenges that you face with new materials? Because it's not easy. Yeah. Um, so obviously, in order to bring down your carbon footprint, which is our biggest priority, you 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 need to kind of you identify the sources, of. and uh, the materials or the product itself is probably 85 to 90 percent of of your carbon footprint. The material itself, at least 65 percent, if not more. So that's kind of obviously your 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 biggest culprit there. So uh, working with innovative new materials has been a huge priority for us. We've kind of orchestrated that around a department we call Fabrics of the Future, uh, where we constantly monitor and work with around 30 different material suppliers. And uh, it, we kind of help them bring their product to the market. So we try to res take responsibility for the fact that there's a lot of like startups kind of inventing great new technologies and kind of developing products on the back of that, but they're struggling to kind of get to scale. Because getting to scale uh, in, a, in a way where their product is a one-to-one -one replacement with the commodities we're currently relying on, where it's on price parity, where it, where it has kind of dropped into the existing supply chain uh, properties, is a, is a tough game because you're up against an industry that's been perfected over a, a couple of hundred, hundred years, right? Um, but in order to help them that we kind of test out their products, we, we launch them in the market, but we always do it with a view to kind of bake it into the core of our business, because otherwise it does make sense. There's a lot of like pilot fatigue going on out there because lots of businesses are happy to strike a collab or marketing partnership with a lot of these startups, right? But if you don't kind of dedicate yourself to building it into the core of your business, then it will have no impact. Because we have a mantra that says kind of only if you are profitable will you scale, only if you scale will you have impact. And we try to kind of repeat that. So at the moment, around 5% of our collection is based on innovative new materials like the way we've sourced out the use of virgin leather by using like uh, biomaterials typically, uh, and we use a lot of recycled leather. Um, and they're like great technologies out there. There's like... Um, they probably the, the craziest one I've worked with is a company out of San Francisco called Ruby Laboratories that takes sequestered carbon and runs it through a cascading process of 20 different enzymes and out comes cellulose pulp that you then can spin into a yarn and weave it and turn it into a proper product, right? Uh, like, the, the products are out there, but uh, getting them to scale is tough, and baking them into your core business, and I'll cut this short, is the biggest problem that everybody's faced with, right? Because there's no one there to pick up the bill. And I, I can maybe with a company like Gany kind of prioritize uh, effort over profits, but like on a broader scale, nobody can do that. So for a while, I guess we all thought there was a green premium out there that would help a lot of these kind of innovative projects transition into the core of uh, brands' businesses. But it isn't, and if it were, it's kind of evaporated over the last year or so, where kind of hard times are starting to hit everybody, right? Um, so that's why I'm constantly, and it's not because I, I feel kind of in a bad place or anything like that, but like any kind of financial uh, incentives that can help kind of spur that development would be extremely welcome. Like the IRA that they have in the U.S. that kind of makes green initiatives deductible, tax deductible, that would have immediate impact on how you conduct your, your business. So you brought it to my next topic, which is going to be money. I always feel like when it comes to sustainability, a lot of fashion brands view it as a loss. You know, if I'm going to be sustainable, I'm going to lose money. You know, and, and whenever I talk to the, what I call the big boys, this ones in this gray suits, they're the decision makers. So it's like, how can we convince them to actually... Um, you know, change how they do business. We need to talk money. So how do you see the industry moving forward in terms of finance? How can we convince them that actually you might pay money today, but you'll save a lot of money in the future? How, I mean, does anyone feel like they have, I guess, a solution or an experience where they've had to talk money um, and sustainability in the same sentence? It, it, it's, not, it's not a profitable business kind of investing in sustainability. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, I, it's still today more from, I, I, and I'm totally opening all flanks for criticism mm. here, but it's like 
it's still somewhat of a moral obligation more than anything else because there's no one along the supply chain to pick up the billboard and I had a, a, a good conversation about that just mm -hmm. before. I mean, he's a supplier, he manufactures this. He, he needs to kind of find the money to replace his boiler with a more efficient one or he needs to install solar panels on, of, on, on the roof of his factory. And you cannot pass it on to, to the end consumer and you shouldn't, for sure not. Like this is our responsibility. You've just got to figure out how to go about it. We, we have a program, again, if we move from carbon uh, offsetting to insetting because we felt kind of that, the, that the, 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 the compensating was being exploited somewhat. So we're trying to kind of use that budget to then install solar panels uh, with the suppliers that we work with, although they're not our suppliers, like they work with everybody in the industry, but then installing kind of solar panels with them. And we see that there's a, like there's a huge willingness from the supplier base to work with us on a project like that. So we literally hardly pay for the actual solar panels, but we pay for the kind of configuration, the project management. We kind of initiate the project. But in many places, especially in Europe, you can pay for the solar panels over your utility bill. So it's not like a, a huge cost per se. It's just a matter of kind of doing it and not waiting for the industry to introduce like industry-wide standards, basically. It's kind of preferring action over perfection. Mm. I mean, I feel like in other industries they do it. So I just kind of wonder what the stop is for fashion. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to, to um, build on what you were saying also earlier on, on the need for economic uh, fiscal incentives, because it's really not fair that those who are actually trying to make efforts to produce in a more sustainable way actually are facing, you know, a disadvantage uh, while they are the ones really making the efforts, and it has impacts on, on also the environment, as you were saying. Um, and the other thing that is really not fair is, uh, for instance, when we expect cotton farmers to also produce more sustainability, to put in place a mechanism um, to identify human rights risks, etc., and we don't support them with the right uh, living income, etc. Um, so, so for me, there is really a strong also. Um, um, need to, to get the right fiscal and economic incentives. And as we were discussing earlier, uh, policy will also really help to uh, level the playing field. So that's really one of the key, one of the key solutions. Can I also speak quickly around um, prices and wages? Because one key thing I wanted to say is that if you, there is a research that shows that if you get a T-shirt that costs 29 euros, do you know how many euros the worker is going to get in terms of wage? It's even not euros, it's 18 cents. So 18 cents out of a 29 euros t-shirt. Um, so I think the discussion needs also to start there in terms of the social justice. Would you like to add something, Fernanda? No, just to say that like in Fashion Revolution, we talk a lot about systemic change and I think it's about that. It's not possible that a brand uh, invest in sustainability just to get profit. It's not about profit. They need to have, uh, they need to change and have an either, another kind of concept of why is in, they are investing and, w and be part of something else, something bigger. Would you like to add something, Nisha? Yeah, I think, um, Sophie, you touched on it briefly about the economic incentives, right? Um, and, and I think as well, Nikolai, we discussed this where, you know, sustainability is seen as a cost. Um, the payoffs needs to change. This isn't just for the fashion industry. This is the whole reason why we are all at COP, because we are trying to move to a more sustainable future. But the truth is the incentives are not where they need to be in order to, for that to happen. Um, if we think about the two biggest raw materials that the fashion industry use, you have cotton and you have oil in order to produce the arm. Um, those are two of the most subsidized industries in the world, if I'm correct. So where they are subsidized industries, we could probably argue that we don't necessarily have the true costs 
of actually what it will be compared to sustainable solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the topics that has been discussed, and forgive me as I don't know how far these conversations have gone, but it is addressing the fact that oil is heavily subsidized. Once we're able to tackle that, then we can reevaluate and have this conversation again to actually see if whether sustainability is indeed a cost or in fact the way we will transition to the future where we are trying to move away from oil. So really thinking about what the incentives look like both in the traditional context and how we need to change that to move towards a more sustainable future, including for fashion, it is part of the thing that will help to alleviate and get us the financial incentive and get brands to act where we need them to be. I think you made an important point, Nisha, when you said that the reason why we're all here is to kind of deal with climate change. And I feel sometimes like fashion is not invited to all the right conversations. We should be in the conversation about agriculture. We should be in the conversation about chemicals. We should be part of that, you know? And, and I'm really grateful that the UNFCCC's Global Innovation Hub is hosting us, but we do actually need to be part of much more bigger conversations because we are the second biggest polluter. And it does worry me sometimes that, you know, fashion can be sidelined a little bit, you know? Um, but what kind of conversations would you want to join at COP28? Or have you come across anything that's of interest that you can feel like, do you know what, actually, I should be here on this stage talking about this? Uh, we actually did. So we, did, we, we had a, a lovely walk through COP yesterday and we found ourselves um, seeing Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And we were amazed at what we saw when we saw when we talk about regenerative agriculture. And this has become a bit of a buzzword in sustainability circles, but nobody actually knows what regenerative agriculture means. When we went to go see Zimbabwe and we saw the key principles of regenerative agriculture that they laid out, they showed us the way that they're actually doing that. These are the conversations that fashion needs to be in. I would even argue these are the conversations that finance needs to be in, as finance are trying to um, finance regenerative agriculture, but you do not actually know what it means until you go to places like this and you see that they are currently doing this work. We need to be in agriculture. We need to be in the emerging markets where these impacts are happening. Other industries we need to be in, we need to be in oil, uh, since we rely on it so much as a um, raw material. We also need to be in chemicals. The biggest thing that, for me, I think that fashion do not necessarily understand is the heavy reliance on agri-chemicals. And, and chemicals are, are all over us. They're in the clothes we wear as the, the microfibers and the sheddings get on us. The, the chemicals on our body are actually going into our bodies. So there are actually research that you can engage with to actually find out what the impact is on your body from wearing your clothes. And part of that impact does come from the chemicals we use. The EU is currently now reviewing its reach policy on chemicals because they know the impact of hazardous chemicals and they're trying to phase them out of the economy. But fashion doesn't actually understand the more than 3,000 chemicals that are used in the processing of their raw materials, so they're not aware of what this will impact them. We need to increasingly engage in other sectors, including oil, chemicals and agriculture to understand the regulation that will hit them, that will impact us through the value chain, to understand what sustainability actually means from the actors that are doing it. I mean, I think when we were there, we actually found out, because we were in Zimbabwe um, Pavilion, and they were talking about this new initiative, and I was like, but are you aware of all the EU regulations, and can you comply? And they said to me, actually, yeah, we are. We are aware of what's going to affect us, and we are kind of changing it to make sure that we are able to provide and stay within the EU regulations, which kind of impressed me because they are fashion brands in the EU who have no clue about what's coming towards them. So I feel like if Zimbabwe can make an effort, so can the fashion brands as well. But I want to talk about social responsibility and labour rights now. And I want to speak with you, Bodhi, you've been quiet there in the corner, with regards to manufacturing. What can we do as an industry to help manufacturers actually come up with really kind of really strong labour rights that support your workers? What does fashion need to do? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we need to be transparent. Uh, first of all, uh, our position as a manufacturer is quite unique in the sense that uh, most of our customers are a global brand. So the first thing that they do is to audit the factory that we have. So that's already a uh, tick in the box. So therefore, uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, pushing for this uh, industry, uh, 
the brand uh, cannot be just one-sided that they want to uh, uh, push the price to the manufacturing. Yeah, because they have to understand the whole supply chains until they get it, they get the product uh, in their retails. Yeah, so therefore, I think uh, the manufacturer should be uh, loud in uh, saying that this price is not uh, possible, and then the brand should also take a consideration to the uh, supply chains, to the manufacturer, so that the whole uh, industry can grow together. I think there's a strong word together, because it hasn't been doing together. There's always someone who paid a price down the line somehow. And Fernando, you work with Fashion Revolution, and you kind of really push forward with the rights of the workers. Um, what challenges have you come across so far? Um, have you seen any kind of advancement with the industry, like the fashion industry, actually getting better? Or do you think we're quite static right now? Yeah, well, Fashion Revolution was created to ask who make my clothes and talking about the people who are behind our clothes. And we are nearly 10 years now. And well, we I think we have seen some progress, but at the same point, we still have so many challenges. You know, we face so many challenges. Uh, we see that now the production is becoming Oh, oh, oops. <laughs> the production is getting faster and faster, and we see all the clothes that goes to the landfills and you know are being discarded. So uh, we still have to go further. We still have we have the fashion transparency index. We do have fashion transparency index in Brazil as well, and it is still not enough. I mean, it makes me question, will it ever be enough? You know, I, I feel like we're still at the why stage rather than the, you know, the how and the doing part of the stage, you know, which is quite quite worrying. But we spoke earlier and we spoke about consumer responsibility. I want to bring kind of the consumers to this conversation because I feel like the blame, there's enough blame to go around and I feel like consumers also play a role in moving the industry forward. What advice would you give consumers when it comes to being more sustainable and also when it comes to being more responsible. Anybody wants to take it first? And if I just go back quickly to the question before around, around workers. Um, so I mentioned already earlier that the, the key problem is also that it's uh, fashion industry is buyer driven, which creates this big power imbalance. And one of the key things that we are doing in fair trade um, is um, really ensuring uh, much more transparent supply chains, which means that buyers know who their suppliers are. And this is really critical because it also helps them to um, prevent, identify, mitigate the, the risks, also in terms of, of wages, of um, violations of workers' rights, etc., um, much more effectively um, through fair trade. Um, and what, one of the key things that we are doing, of, of course, is that we are doing certification. So we have a textile standard, and as part of this standard, there is an obligation um, in, in the next six years to, to achieve a living wage. So when the company becomes fair trade certified, they have six years to put in place a living wage, and we are, of course, providing a lot of support to get there. So that's also one of the, one of the solutions. To come back now to the, your question on consumers, I would say really, it's, it's also important to not to put too much the blame on, on consumers. I think it's, again, those multi-stakeholders approach that so we all have a role to play in this um, sustainability um, challenge. Um, and yeah, probably one of the options for consumers is also to, to, to buy um, uh, fair trade or to buy to companies who are doing all this work that, that you already mentioned. So if, if there is not yet enough fiscal and economic incentives to support the ones who are making the efforts, then this is where the consumers have a role to play because this is a bit like a voting right. So they need to support the ones who are really actually um, uh, putting in place really robust system to become more sustainable. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, Nikolai. Yeah, um, I, I think my biggest advice would be, because I don't expect the individual consumer to kind of have in-depth knowledge of what's going on 
and what the different decorations or, or, or certificates mean. So I'd probably, my biggest recommendation would be to buy less, obviously, although that's a very <laughs> sensitive topic also because it pertains to kind of degrowth and I cannot get my head around that topic really, although I'd, I'd love it. But unfortunately, I see whenever there's no growth, people stop investing in this area, so I, I, I won't go into that. Um, but buy less and then find brands or trademarks or certificates that you align with on a kind of DNA or value level and then kind of stick to them, stay loyal to those. But else than that, my biggest ask for the average consumer is to go vote for someone that kind of prioritizes the green agenda. Because like only through politicians can you have proper leverage, right? It's hard to make a change as a, an individual consumer. I've been through that for many years until I kind of gave up. It was more mental cleanse for me. And at one point I realized that I wasn't changing anything. I wasn't buying any clothes for seven years, which is a little hypocritical when you, <laughs> when you run a fashion label. So I gave up on that bit. Yeah, I think it's important to ask who are those consumers? Because like when we are in Brazil, most of people can't consume, consume like brands that they want. Sometimes they don't consume at all. So who are they? When we see like numbers, when we see like, uh, uh, like in, in, in Latin America, we have loads of clothes that comes from North America. So who are they, where they are? And don't blame them too much because like in our country, for instance, most of people can't consume at all. What about you, Nisha, from a fashion waste perspective? I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, I think, first of all, I just want to come back to this language of blame because I think it's really important for us to move away from that. We don't have time to be saying you're to blame because if you use that language, people get, get their backs up on the wall, they get defensive, they try and, you know, like, argue that point. We don't have time to be arguing that. Rather, I'd like to talk, when we talk about blame, instead think about accountability. Like, who are you accountable for? Like, who is my product accountable for once it reaches end of life? So that's important to emphasize on the language. But then again, this is not the consumer who has caused this issue. The consumer has been driven towards fast fashion friends by innovative marketing techniques, the price staying stable as our incomes rise. So the consumer's habits are all as a result of, you know, the, the industry and how it's moved and having so much oversupply of clothing because they can, they can produce them so cheaply that they have to artificially create this demand. So that's really important to lay out. But then um, we do need to have mindset shifts when it comes to consumers. And whilst we do not have time, mindset shifts and getting people that are not in the room here today who are not driven by sustainability concerns, who are the ones probably over-consuming more than us in this room, getting them involved is going to take time. So rather than persuading them on arguments, one of the biggest things I probably tell people is to think about investing in quality rather than quantity. I say this because we do not necessarily have the language or the information to demonstrate this, but if you were to invest in a premium product, a premium shirt versus a shirt from a fast fashion brand that is of lower quality, over, let's say, a time frame of two years, just arbitrarily putting out a number, um, you may have to replace the shirt from a fast fashion brand two to three times compared to investing in a quality shirt which you may be able to keep for the duration of two years or more. That in itself is moving towards the sustainable future that we want to see as it puts less resources into the shirt. You hold it for longer. If you think about the circular economy principles for fashion, it's about keeping things in reuse for longer. Even when that higher quality shirt comes into the downstream and flows into Marks and Cantor Manto, it is in better quality for the local retailers and upcyclers to repurpose, reuse that and recommodify that. So everything starts about from the beginning what we do Everything needs to be quality to tell the consumer that you're investing in this, you can keep this for longer, use this for longer, and then downstream we have better quality for that. That would be my first thing to consumers before I try and persuade them on sustainability argument, which could be harder. Let's work on that first, and then we can eventually work to bring down your consumption. That's a very good answer, actually. Um, I wanted to ask another question, but I've noticed the time, and I want to put, open it up to people on, okay? 
let's start off with this lady here. Put her hand up first. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Leticia. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm with the, CIS, the Climate Change Media Partnership here. So I have two questions, actually. Uh, one is about the re reuse and recycling. How can we turn them mainstream? Because we know planet is finite. We don't have enough resources, so we cannot keep producing forever. Uh, and the other question is about the price. So as Fernanda mentioned, a lot of people don't have the power to, the financial power to buy sustainable clothes because sustainable clothes are more expensive because they internalize all the costs. And one of the problems in the industry is the externalizing of all the costs. So how to balance um, the price of the, the clothing, the fair price of the clothing, and to, to turn it in a way in that people can buy? Because a lot of people, they are aware of the impact of the industry, but they don't have the financial power to, to, to buy the clothes they wanted. So how do we balance that? It's a very good question. Anyone want to tackle it first? I, I can comment to the reuse aspect. Yes. Okay, Nisha, then Nikolai. Sure. So I'll just address the reuse part of your question. I think it's important to emphasize, if I haven't already, that the reuse systems and the reuse skills that we need are already happening in communities like Cantamanto. They can process up to 25 million garments a month. That is an incredible number. So where we have those skills doing that, we now need to work about how do we get the skills, the work that they're actually doing to wider markets. And this is where I would more put out an appeal because I'm always looking to engage with stakeholders who want to engage in the reuse market because we have people doing that. How do we now take that to other markets in the global north? You have certain um, retailers that are doing more re-commerce now. How do we get them to engage with communities in the global south that are already doing reuse? That's really the first thing to me that we really need to understand that reuse economies do exist. They're very localized or small, but if we're able to engage further across the value chain, probably enhanced by digital technologies to allow us to collaborate. This is how we can bring that further to the mainstream. Thank you, Nisha. Nikolai, you would like to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that from a kind of tech point of view, I, I see a lot of great projects coming our way at scale, especially within uh, poly recycling, polyester recycling, and cotton recycling. There's Renewcell, Circ, Amber Circle, Reju, and a secret project from Sweden that's launching at scale. And uh, the, the, the only kind of challenge is obviously the CAPEX involved, like the investments involved in building these factories and kind of, again, the lack of a green premium that will allow these businesses to transition into the market and into a competitive state, which brings me to your other kind of issue, and that is kind of passing that cost along to the, uh, the end consumer. And... That, it's a huge problem. I think I, it's really, really hard to compute, but like in, in a business like ours, I'd say it's probably at least 2% and maybe up towards 5 7 8% of our margins that kind of evaporates in, in our sustainability effort. And it's, uh, some of it is kind of direct cost, like the people you employ, the certificates, the consultants, the technical platforms, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of that is, and, and it's really hard to explain, but it's us kind of facing out a uh, cowboy boot that's the best seller, but we cannot find, uh, we insist on kind of not using virgin leather, and we cannot find a biomaterial that will replace two colorways. Those two colorways make up $2.4 million of sales for us, so it's a lot of money. And we ultimately decide to face them out. That was probably the biggest decision I was part of making at Ghani because that's like real money on the table, but because we couldn't replace them, we decided to face them out, hoping that we'll find an alternative in the process, but we did so. So you, you're constantly kind of faced with those kind of challenges, and they are really hard to figure out how to come, like get around if, if you want to avoid kind of passing on the cost to the end consumer, but some of it is passed on which makes sustainability or responsibility or whatever you want to call it a somewhat exclusive exercise. No, very briefly, what's, what's probably um, costly is really to set up also the sustainability systems, as you were saying. So I think paying, paying workers, cotton farmers, um, 
uh, living wage, uh, living income is probably not what's going to be really making a big difference in the final price. Um, what is costly is really to set up all those um, environmental and human rights due diligence systems. And so right now in fair trade, we're trying to assess how much costly it is to comply with the upcoming uh, directive at EU level on, on, on uh, human rights and environmental due diligence. And we're also really trying to support companies in setting up those systems. Um, and again, I mean, I think the key of there is, is to provide, is for governments to really provide the enabling environment um, in terms of incentives um, to ensure that the prices um, remain um, affordable for consumers. Thank you. I saw there's one question. Ooh, I've only got room for one more question. So because the lady there with her hand up in the second row put her hand up last, we will share one question with you, Laura. So I have two questions, but I'll, the first one is more food for thought for everyone here. What if instead of using the word consumer, because within that word, there's the word of consuming, we use a word called user. So we don't consume like we consume water. We'll, con we'll use our clothing. So that's food for thought for everyone here. And then the second question is, how do we clothe 10 billion people sustainably? If we can just like put it in one sentence for everyone to think about the rest of the day. Okay, who wants to tackle that question? How do we clothe 10 billion people sustainably? Who wants to start first with how they envision that? Okay, Nicola, you're brave. Let's start with you. It, it, it's, it's hard to see the silver line, right? In all honesty, I, I, I don't see that happening in, in all honesty. But uh, I, I think, uh, from my perspective, we're, we're down to kind of technology as the only factor that will somewhat save us. And uh, obviously, I'm hoping for people, like, for, I think people will change their patterns of usage, not consumption. Uh, and that will help. But else than that, I can only see us kind of recycling, but also introducing innovative <laughs> new materials uh, that are, like, produced in a climate-friendly way. And, and it's doable, but uh, it, it, there's a long way to it. But as a side note, although... I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not involved in day-to-day -day operations, but I think we only use uh, recycled poly, and still it's like the third biggest source of our carbon pollution. So even though we just like insist on using uh, recycled poly, it's still a huge contributor to our carbon footprint. So it's hard to kind of solve. To make a balance with technology, I would say that, yeah, like we need to look into the nature, to look to the past, to look into where our ancestors used to make clothes, how they used to keep these clothes, how, how they, uh, about their relationship with clothes. So I think it is about that, like a heritage, ancestor, and nature. Um, essentially, sustainability for who? is the key thing. Sustainability for who and for what? Sustainability can mean environmental, social issues. So we really need to bog down on what we actually mean by sustainability. One thing we haven't discussed today is aspects of clothing poverty. It is an issue that's rising somewhere in the UK where people can actually afford access to adequate clothing. This is honestly why the aspect of the quality of clothing really does matter because Climate change is real, the impacts are real, people are feeling them. we cannot deal with poor quality clothing. So ensuring that what we are producing is quality for all is the key thing. That happens when you bring all the stakeholders, representatives of the stakeholders into the room. 10 billion is a lot. Clothing means a lot to different people. I think um, the environmental and the social aspects are actually very much linked. So um, if we make progress on the social justice elements, we also make progress on the environmental one and vice versa. And I think um, the solutions, we already mentioned them. For me, it's really pushing for the right regulation, the regulation that we really need. And that's going really to improve the lives of, of farmers and workers. And then having honest discussions, how we are having right now as part, all part of this sector, uh, and really bringing together in the same room farmers, workers, brands, retailers, suppliers, consumers, and, and, and having those discussions. 
Bodhi. How do we uh, clothe 10 billion people sustainably? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, this is the one that I uh, brought up earlier is about the manufacturing. It's about the human, right? The human is very important because we carry a lot of uh, labor intensive industry. So therefore, uh, even though we uh, take care of the, uh, uh, the climate as well, but uh, the most important thing is uh, the people. Yeah, the people has to be uh, resilient, I would say. Yeah, so it's, it's good for everybody. And then they can adapt uh, along the way and then become uh, uh, part of the community together with uh, the rest of the global team. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to add something? Anyone else? Okay. Oh, we've got, okay, one question. You literally, um, can, yeah, to that lady, just a quick one because we're running out okay. of time. I have a question for Sophie, but before that, I quickly wanted to say that if I'm from Fashion Revolution Pakistan, and um, something that we really need to focus on is indigenous knowledge. Uh, craftspeople that we've had for generations, and it's been very sustainable. So I think that's really important, especially um, in terms of Pakistan as well. We have fabric that they've been making for 5,000 years that they use from herbs that are local that does not use any sort of chemicals. So I really feel like we need to make that connection with craftspeople and involve them into this conversation as well. Um, the question for Sophie is, Sophie, I only know of one organize one business in Pakistan, which is artistic millionaires that are fair trade, have one, I think, particular um, unit that is fair trade certified. And um, how can, and that's one of the largest denim factories in Pakistan, how can smaller suppliers, smaller businesses get that fair trade certification? Because when I've talked to people, they said that the certification is so expensive that they cannot afford it, which obviously then leaves them out of the market for the fair trade. And I'm a huge proponent of fair trade myself. I've worked at 10,000 villages for years, so I understand, you know, and, and, and consumers, by the way, are very smart. When they see fair trade certified, they will go for that, for sure. But how can suppliers who are not large businesses get that certification? How can that be affordable for them? I don't know if you can answer this in a minute and 30 seconds, but let's give it a go. Uh, yeah, perhaps with the conversation we can take separately, but uh, this is where, for instance, we are trying to partner with some donors to support this cost of the certification. And indeed, the certification is, is very costly because, again, there are all those systems to put in place and people don't realize that um, being sustainable, it requires a lot of systems. And this is what is expensive also in terms of the audit. Credibility is expensive, actually. But uh, thank you very much for your support and thank you for the reference to indigenous people. Fair trade is trying to take the direction of agroecology, and I think nobody knows better what agroecology is than indigenous people. So thank you for that. Well done, Sophie. That was really good. But now I'm going to wrap up because I know it's time for us to wrap up. But I want to say, first of all, thank you so much to everyone on this panel for sharing your knowledge. Um, and when you think of that question, how to clothe 10 billion people sustainably, let that be your goal. You know, let that be what will lead you to get there. And we are hoping to continue this conversation. This will not be the end. This is the intro to what we need to do um, going next and the next steps that we need to do. So please feel free. I know I wasn't able to take all your questions. So please feel free to approach our panelists afterwards and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And we hope that this honest, transparent conversation gave you something to think about a little bit. Um, so thank you again, United Nations Climate Change Global Innovation Hub, for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're hereby relieved, and we will call you for the next round because we are working on.